Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the latest Shiny podcast. With me today, as usual, is Rob Hirschfeld. Uh, good morning, Rob. Good morning, Stephen. How are you? Good. And uh, we have a really interesting guest today. I'm excited to talk to Nick Jackson from HashiCorp, who is a developer advocate. Uh, this is my first time talking to Nick, so I'm really interested in what he has to say. Nick, welcome. And uh, just tell us a little bit about your background. Hey, thanks very much for having me. Um, so I'm a developer advocate at, at HashiCorp. Um, I've been with HashiCorp for about 12 months now. And prior to that, I've done a, a sort of a number of things in the, in the industry. I've, I've been working in the industry for about 20 years now. So um, a reasonable length of time. And throughout that duration, I've pretty much been centered around internet sort of based technologies. So Nick and, and HashiCorp, uh, it's worth, right, we're big fans, Racken's big fans of HashiCorp and ha HashiCorp Tech. Can you give us sort of an a overview of, of HashiCorp and, and, and where they fit in the market? Yeah, so HashiCorp, everything, we're, I think we're about five years old now as, as an organization. And the, the company was started by Mitchell and Armand back, back then, five years ago, when they just sort of left college. And they came up with a product called Vagrant. And the intention behind Vagrant was to try and reduce the complexity in, in this kind of new way of development that we're, we were, were seeing. So cloud was adding a lot of layers of complexity, but it was also solving a lot of problems. But when we started to deal with things like VMs, you, you kind of needed some tooling around that. To, to kind of be able to test the, the VMs, to be able to kind of spin them up and, and you know, just testing your, your, your sort of applications. And, and Vagrant kind of fit into the market there and, and started to solve those problems. So that was kind of phase one. But, you know, Mitchell and Armand had this big picture. They, they had this kind of, this, this multi-year plan where they were looking at the industry even back then and they were saying, right, there's a number of problems that we're seeing in the industry. Um, and that they had plans for this kind of suite of products, which would be, be released to, to kind of try and solve all of these problems with, with um, DevOps flow, distributed computing. So then came uh, Packer and Console, uh, Vagrant, and of course, Terraform. So we, we introduced tooling to manage um, security for managing your um, machine images with, with Packer, managing the problem of distributed computing, configuration management, um, service discovery, and, and health checking with, with console. And of course, Terraform, introducing the concepts of, of infrastructure as code, which I, I personally, I'm a big fan of. And, and we're big fans, and I want to be careful that we don't turn uh, this podcast into a uh, one commercial and two uh, too much of a fan uh, thing because I, I really do. We we find that uh, the technologies and the suite of technologies. I'm like, oh yeah, all those. You, you what Vault was another one that that you didn't include in your list um, that we see a lot of excitement about. Um, but I also want to be pragmatic about what. Uh, the tools are and how they work. And I think it's really interesting to get you to talk not just about where their strengths are, but also talk through some of the weaknesses and some of the design philosophies. Because yeah. what, what we see is, you know, this isn't a big integrated suite, right? A lot of these tools are components that, that are sort of isolated. Can you talk to that? So what, what we try to do both. So what we try to do is we, we, we kind of recognize that people want choice. They want, they want freedom. So we don't want to lock everybody into having to use the entire suite if that's not what, what you want to do. We want people to be able to kind of pick and mix. So for example, you might be um, using Chef or, or Ansible to, to sort of manage provisioning of, of applications and infrastructure and things like that. You know, you, you can still use Vault and that will pair really, really nicely with Chef or Ansible. Um, likewise, if, you, if you're using things like 
um, KMS and, and your cloud-based services to, to provide some of the security aspects, then you can still use Terraform. If you're using Kubernetes and you've got at CD, you can still integrate with Terraform and Vault. You, you can lay a console on the top if you have to, if you want to, but we, we try to make tools that work as well independently as they do as a suite to, to, to allow practitioner flexibility. I think that's a really big, big point. And it, it's one of the things I like about the HashiCorp philosophy, right? So Hashi has their own container scheduler called Nomad. Um, and it, one of the things that I appreciate about it is that you're not trying to throw it up as the big, as a, into the competitive mix with all the other, right? You know, we have this sort of Kubernetes contest, um, totally, you know, not totally manufactured because people need to pick one. And yet HashiCorp has a reasonable uh, container scheduler, very lightweight, simple to use, um, called Nomad. And you're not, you know, really part of that battle. Um, so hashi has been able to have sort of neutral ground from that perspective. And that's, I like that a lot. Uh, you know, it's sort of the at rack and we tried to do the same thing. We're trying to be part of people's tool chains and not say, Oh, you're, you know, you, you have to use chef puppet ansible salt or this technology or that technology. If you're going to use our tool chain, um, and yeah. that's best. That's really productive. Uh, well, I think it's a, it's a kind of one of the core sort of approaches of the organization we, you know we um we we integrate with kubernetes so there there is a kubernetes terraform provider you can um do authentication and and sort of um with with vault and, and kubernetes so we we kind of just because we have a schedule a nomad we we don't sort of mandate and say well okay if you want to use vault you you have to use it with nomad that doesn't make sense and in it it kind of, it wouldn't work the way that we would want to work. So it feels wrong to kind of try and push that on, on our customers. So we do believe in, in that sort of open integrated environment because that's the way people are building systems. Nomad, of course, you know, it's a great scheduler. I'm a, I'm a massive personal fan. But if you want to uh, sort of have a workload built around Kubernetes, then, you know, you as an organization, you do your assessments and you, and you kind of, you make your choices. For us, it's about trying to support all of those choices that, that you make to, to just try and make your life easier. So if somebody was to start off on one scheduler and then migrate to another scheduler, you, is, that a, is that something that, how do, I'm trying to think of the ways you engage with HashiCorp because you, you've been transitioning. A lot of these tools have been free. Um, I know in the Austin Summit, um, last last year, um, 1.0 came out, which sort of implies licensed content. Um, how, what's what's that engagement model look like for people? Because there's certainly HashiCorp and free tools are sort of have, have been synonymous in the past. That that absolutely is going to stay. I mean, HashiCorp is an, a company which is built on an open source community, and and we are not going anywhere away from that. Uh, as an organization, it, it makes sense that we have a revenue stream. And what, what we try to do is, is be fair. So we, we sort of call on them enterprise products because they, they really are. You know, they, they really only contain the features that, that a very small percentage of the market would require. So if you're, if you're kind of not operating like ultra, ultra scale, you probably don't need to be running vault replication. So therefore, don't pay for Vault Replication, use the open source software. All of the features are there. Um, you've got exactly the same grade encryption. You've got exactly the same support for the backends and authentication providers. And the same goes with Terraform. Terraform Enterprise adds a, a layer of workflow that makes sense if you're operating in a particular scale. If you, if you have an organization which is highly distributed or a team which is of a particular scale or you have regulatory compliance which is um, placed upon you then using a tool like terraform enterprise makes all of that easy if you don't then terraform open source is is 100 capable we 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 do not and will not sort of try and introduce like a crippleware or 
like any feature, um, missing features to try and force the, the sort of users to, to, to upgrade. We, we really want to kind of just concentrate on, on the, the, the enterprise market, that, that sort of Fortune 2000, Fortune 500, FTSE 100 customer. Makes sense. One of the things that, that I know with HashiCorp and people, people under, you know, sort of understand, but, but it's different from the way you build open source communities um, because HashiCorp still maintains its open source software, but HashiCorp maintains a pretty tight control on that open source community. Um, unlike, you know, the, you know, something more like an OpenStack or a Kubernetes where it, by design, it's a multi-vendor sort of stomping ground. Hashi has a, has a different model. It, can you talk about that a little bit, what people can expect in those communities? Yeah, I mean, we, you know, we, we welcome um, community pull requests. What, what we're actually conscious of, though, is we want to maintain a really high level of quality. So we, we want to be able to release often to, to keep the features out um, for, for our, our users. And we want to make sure that the, the applications are stable. I mean, if, if you're running something like console in a, in a huge distributed cloud, then, you know, if, we, if we're not really, really careful on the, the features and the quality that goes into that application, we can cause a lot of damage to, to our users. So we're, we're, we're really careful about that. Um, I think, it's, it's trying to, to kind of help as well to, to work as a, as a broker to, you know, assist the community and, you know, nobody's ever going to get it right all of the time, but we, you know, we, we do try very, very hard. A lot of HashiCorp resources go into the, the, the open source um, products. There's, there's teams working on, on those products, but actually quite a bit of the work, from those teams is working with open source contributors and, and helping them get pull requests over the line and maybe assisting on, on um, ways to kind of share our knowledge to, to enhance a feature. Um, so it's a, it, it's a, I think it's a difficult thing. And I think as we, we grow, it's, it's a more difficult problem, but it's, it's something that we're, we're absolutely committed to. We, we absolutely love the community and we appreciate every single person who um, contributes. I, one of the things I, I like to, to see and the reason that's worth discussing uh, is that you know, nobody's really figured out what the right open source models are. Um, we're all trying to figure out how, you know, we, we, you know, I believe very strongly in open source. I think it's the right way to create communities and innovation. Um, I, we we were just talking with uh, Gina Lat on our, our previous podcast, you know, about vendor versus open source and and, and trying to get that type of, of balance right. And there's a, a challenge for for operational software. And I think one of the things I, I see in HashiCorp is that you're really writing software for operators. There's a lot of developer tooling and things like that, but fundamentally, when when I think about HashiCorp, I think it's very operate operator operationally focused software. Um, and it's, it's not always clear to me that open source communities build that well um, in a multi-vendor situation because there's, um, actually, I, I don't know why. I'd be interested in your opinion. You're, you're raising your eyebrows at me. Uh, why, why do you think that is? Um, I don't know. I think it's, it's, it's really difficult because I think there's, you know, there's, there's a, a lot of polarization in the market. So if you're an AWS fan or an, let's say, let's, let's use the Apple Google market, right? I mean, if you, if you have an iPhone, you are probably like really strongly pro iPhone and not necessarily interested in Android. But if you're an Android fan, then it's, it's sort of quite the opposite. And I think when it comes to cloud vendors and tooling and, um, and things like that, you have a, a very similar sort of problem. So when you start getting this multi-vendor, you have these different camps who are very passionate about their own sort of um, the vendor that they're backing. Right. And you've got to try and sort of bridge them together to, to work together and 
to sort of cooperate. Um, it, it's not easy. I mean, I think one of the things that we do have, the, the sort of, the, which is a great thing, is we have companies like Racken who will sort of support their, their Terraform provider. So they will kind of kickstart that community movement by, by sort of laying down the, the, the bones and, and getting something going so that it makes it easier for contributors. And the same goes for, for Google. So there are engineers at Google working on the GCP Terraform provider. There's engineers at Azure working on the, the, the Azure provider. And the, the, as goes for a lot of the, the sort of the providers, I, I think most people are pretty sort of cooperative. I mean, I'm, I don't sort of see a lot of problems and, and I think Terraform's a good, a good example. Um, but the, the provider plugins don't necessarily cause any friction with the, the Terraform call. Um, and the, the community right. seems... Yeah. Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead, finish your sentence and I'll... I'll I don't want to say, um, and, and the kind of community as a whole seems to sort of get around sort of Terraform no matter what their individual camp is. So this is... Yeah, we've been using and watching Terraform for a long time, and there's an interesting sequence of history with this because, right, uh, Terraform was retooled to split out the providers, um, which meant that you didn't have to contribute to Terraform in order to add a provider, um, which is a huge, it's a huge change, right? Decoupling the versioning um, of the infrastructure or the target from the software itself is a, is a big deal. Um, and this is one of those subtleties uh, that I think is worth, I'll, I'll explain a little bit and I'd love to hear your commentary on it, but there's so much, and, and I love Terraform, so I'm happy to spend the rest of the time actually talking about Terraform. Um, the, but here's, here's the dilemma. Every, the, the world we live in is made up of a lot of small parts. Um, Nick's done some talking about microservices too. We probably won't go there. Um, too much, but in those, we have hundreds of interconnected versions of different pieces. And so it's, everything has its own life cycle. Uh, for example, Docker version changes used to break everything built on top of it, whether it was in your release cycle or not. Uh, and so if, if, if I'm writing software like Digital Rebar and I build a provider for Terraform and Digital Rebar comes out with a fix or a change or an improvement and we want to take advantage of it, we don't want our, that change to be beholden to Terraform's release cycle where we have to be like, well, you have to be in the queue and you have to have our pull requests accepted and all those, those sort of things. So by splitting out the provider model, you decoupled all of those all of those other systems from the terraform release cycle do you, you want to ex expand on that add points or that you know that's absolutely right i mean it's that that was one of the main intentions because the thing is about the terraform core terraform core is pretty pretty solid it, it um it, it sort of doesn't undergo a great deal of churn but providers and um are adding sort of features all of the time and, and you're absolutely right. You know, you, as digital rebar, you add a feature, you do not want to have to wait six weeks for a Terraform release um, in order to, to get those features out to your, to your customers and your users. And when Terraform was, was kind of small and you only had a few providers, then you didn't really have so much of a problem. Now there are over 70 providers, then this is a kind of a, a much, much bigger problem. The, there's another kind of technical reason as well why it makes sense to, to split things out is that we, we have um, integration tests for every provider. So we will run, um, for, for example, in terms of a cloud provider, we will run an integration test which will create an instance of that resource in the cloud and we will have some tests which will check that the definition of the Terraform resource matches the actual instance that's being created. Now, as the clouds have gotten bigger and all of the, the, the sort of the, the APIs behind the providers, those test suites are just getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. 
So if we have to run that entire integration suite every time we want to do a release, it can, you know, it can sometimes take days to, to sort of complete, even running massively parallel. When you have independence in terms of the providers, then in order to release a provider, you just need to kind of make sure that the unit tests and the, the, the sort of the functional integration tests pass. If there's a problem, then actually it's a relatively straightforward process to, to be able to either roll that back because you've got versioning on the provider or to, to push a new, a new release. And you don't have to wait for these kind of weekly sort of um, release cycles of the, the, the main Terraform. So I, I think you hit the nail on the head. That, that's absolutely it. It's, it's, it's about cadence. It's about being able to help um, provider creators like yourself to be able to get changes out when you want them without having to be beholden to our release schedules. And, that, and that's what builds ecosystem. The, the other things I would highlight in this is this is one of the differences between a you know, sort of a single vendor or a, um, a, a vendor dominated open source project and a community dominated open source project. Because in this case, uh, and, and for the listeners, I, I want to be very clear, HashiCorp is, is actually setting up a program to do corporate, where, where a corporation or a company or an entity, doesn't have to be a company, but somebody signs up and says, I will make sure that the tests are passing and if people have questions, they get an answer, you know, they, they get answered um, for providers in an open source project. And then those providers are also open source, but the type of responsibility that is you know, being asked for in doing this so it shows very clearly that there is an expectation that you know, these are supported, tested, you know, high rigor items. And that is an operational statement. Um, you know, it, it's not, it's one thing to say, oh, the community run, has, runs a whole bunch of integration tests and we test these units. Um, actually making sure that people in the ecosystem have a way to be part of that and subscribe and manage it. Um, you know, that's, that's a big statement. Um, it's a different, it's a different way yeah. of looking at open source. But I think it's important because Ultimately, we, you know, we, we, we dog food our, our own tool. You know, we use our own tooling. We, we've been on the, the wrong end when things go wrong and you, you can't deploy your infrastructure because there's a bug. And, and that's not, not a great place to be. So we, we kind of want to, to, to sort of create the best experience for people. And, and, you know, it's not just a thing about that people are going to come shouting, saying, oh, Terraform's broken. It, it's about trying to just help to share our experience of, of working on these providers ourselves for a number of years and, and being able to assist people so that they can provide the, the highest possible quality to their customers. And um, I think that's, that's where, it is, where it's about. It, it is trying in some ways, it might be seen as controlling, but it's, it's not intended. It's really about just trying to help, trying to, to be responsible for, for everything. Well, I, I think this is the balance, right? Um, there's a certain degree of being an opinionated. Um, and I think one of the, 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 the hallmarks of, of HashiCorp is there's a degree of architectural opinion. Um, it's not necessarily to all the way to religion, but it, it's definitely, you know, the way the tools are built, the way they're used, there's, there's certain, you know, consistency in thought, in scope um, around those. And, and I, it, it makes a difference, right? We, when we build software, we, we look at the way HashiCorp does it. We have very similar mantras, very simple modeling um, about how we try and build tools, right? Good CLIs, uh, you know, we were big fans of Golang too, um, you know, the, a lot of the 12 factor auth and then building a lot of small tools that you expect to work together, um, but not requiring them to work together, I think is a big deal. Um, and then for the, for HashiCorp, for, for Terraform specifically, unlike some of the other, other uh, uh, tools, you know, it doesn't do anything without the providers. So, um, right. Uh, it, it really becomes a, how do you test and integrate all those pieces together? Um, you know, and it's funny because we looked at, 
you know, there's some things that like HashiCorp's done with plugin models. It, literally our team, um, our CTO, Greg Althaus was evaluating, you know, patterns that you all have. In this case, we didn't follow one of your patterns. Um, we can, that, that would be its own fun discussion, uh, maybe for another follow up with Greg um, about, about why and, and what uh, much deeper tech than I'm ready to go. Um, but sort of fun discussion. So there is one thing about Terraform though, because you know, what I hear from people about Terraform and there's the design choice that I'd like to talk about is Terraform is awesome and Terraform is horrible at the same time. Right. Um, you know, at, at the HashiConf, you know, I think I, I counted five different presentations of people who'd written uh, Terraform plan generator applications, <laughs> uh, which I started to think was an anti-pattern. Um, but yet it seems like a, an obvious feature for HashiCorp to consider. What's, what's your thought on sort of the edges around Terraform, why they're there, you know, how, how they should get addressed? Um, I mean, I think the first thing is, you know, Terraform, Terraform is, a, is still quite a young product um, in, in a sense. I mean, it, you know, three, three, was it like three years, maybe coming on four. That's, that's not a, a, a sort of a great deal of time to, to be in, in the industry, especially at this pace of change. So, yeah, there's, there are some, some rough edges. But I think the, what we try to do is we, we try to sort of find the core use case that, that fits most people's needs and, and concentrate on that. I think there's always going to be an edge which I'll be honest, we, we probably can never sort of get to um, either because it, it just doesn't work with the way that Terraform has been designed or just, just because we don't sort of have the time to, to look at those features. Um, I think in general, though, I, I'm actually sort of quite a fan of, um, of Terraform and of, of HCL in, in general. I think it it's about, it's, it's easy to say infrastructure is code, but ultimately the key thing around code, no matter what you're writing it for, is that it's designed and it's written to be read by humans. Like a machine doesn't care how you write code. A machine can interpret anyway, because it's a machine. It, like it doesn't look at things with the same sort of eyes that, that we do. And... And when you're writing code, you, you're actually writing it for another, another programmer. And, and I think the definitions around sort of HCL about trying to be declarative and, and trying to be very sort of readable that I think it's difficult to say that maybe your infrastructure can read like a story, but I, you know, you can get pretty close to it. You can kind of see the dependencies and you can kind of, see the, the, the declarations and the, the, the instances of resources. So we could probably get a lot cleverer around doing um, some things like having more sort of loops. Loops is something which, which always comes up. Like um, mm. you've obviously got counts on resources, but you don't have like concepts like a while or a for loop that um, you would do in a, a traditional programming construct. And um, and, you know, I think we, we're actually reasonably believers in, in verbosity and sometimes cut and paste isn't really such a bad thing. Yes, it adds a maintenance overhead because if you change once, you maybe got to change twice, but it does make things very, very explicit. So it, I think trying to find that balance is, is a very difficult problem. I, and this is, this is the thing that we sort of looked at at, and, and in some ways dismissed the power of Terraform originally because it doesn't have abstract, the abstractions that people want for multi-cloud portability. It's like, well, if I write a plan, that plan is not going to work. So if it's an Amazon plan, it's not going to work at Google. And, yeah. and so there's, there was a part of me, especially two years ago when I was first looking at, at you know, really seriously at Terraform, um, of saying, hey, I want a plan that's going to be portable. And, you know, at the time, Rackham was building, you know, trying to do multi-cloud, you know, 
hybrid portability and things like that. And you start peeling back that onion and it doesn't take you but one layer of abstraction to realize infrastructures are too different to create right. functional abstraction. You can create an abstraction and it's like, I need a machine with an operating system on it and anything additional is not portable. <laughs> no, I, it's, and this is, you know, this is super interesting because the, to an extent, it may be possible with certain resources. So things like cloud storage is, is probably something which is relatively sane across every provider. But when you start looking at like a virtual machine, I mean, different clouds have different ways that, that you attach a network. Sometimes a network is actually a network interface and that belongs to a machine. Sometimes the network is something that the machine attaches to. So you've got a kind of an inverted parent child relationship. Um, it would be so, so difficult. And, and I think the problem is as well that, that actually if you're gonna operate successfully in a, in a cloud, you actually have to have a reasonable level of understanding. You, you need to understand how the security groups work, how the networks work, how routing works how the auto scaling and the, the instances and, and all of those things work on a, on a cloud specific level because they are so difficult. And, and that makes abstraction like almost impossible. I think what you can and, do and though is- one, one of the points about abstraction is that either you can do it or you can't. It, right. it, is, it is very frustrating to have partial abstractions. Uh, it, they end up costing you more then, 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 right. right. You, you don't get to choose. It's like, Oh, I want an abstraction for this, but not for that. If you're crossing your abstraction boundaries, you're not actually getting benefit. Yeah, no. And that's absolutely the case. And, and that would be almost definitely what would happen. So you, you know, we might be able to create an abstraction around storage, but we certainly couldn't do it around a VM. So you would have maybe storage and then you've got three different instances of VMs and, and it, it just makes things really difficult. They would be actually be really difficult to understand, and really difficult to read. Right. But if you kind of take abstraction in a different way and start looking up a level, so rather than looking at the concept of um, a virtual machine or a network, if you think about what is the purpose of that virtual machine and that network, it, it's part of a cluster. Right. Now, actually, you can form an abstraction with something like a cluster because you can write a module. So you could have a module which has a common interface for creating, let's say a Kubernetes cluster in GCP or creating a Kubernetes cluster in Azure or a Kubernetes cluster in AWS. And you could define a common interface around things like you know, machine sizes or um, number of machines, um, security groups, and, and that sort of thing. And, and that's a manageable abstraction. So it's, it's kind of possible. And I think with the module registry, that's what we're, we're hoping that we can sort of start to, to get toward. But yeah, it's, it's really a difficult problem. Well, this, this comes back. You said something that I just, I absolutely loved. I want to, to have you expand on because you, you, you said this sort of paradox. You're like, the industry is moving really fast and we're not old enough yet to deal with that uh, as a tool. And it seems like a paradox, right? We're, we're celebrating, you know, the second year of Kubernetes and welcoming its world domination, which is a little bit silly. Um, how, how do you, you know, why do you say it like that? How do you think, what, what, what helps people go faster? Um, so I think it's, it's really difficult because there's, we, we don't kind of know what the end state is. You know, we, we can't even predict what, what the end state's going to be in, in, in 18 months. Right. Um, things are moving so fast. Like the Kubernetes thing's a great one. Um, two years ago, Mesos was literally the scheduler of choice. You know, if you're running a system in production, you're running Marathon or Mesos or DCOS. Um, Kubernetes hadn't really been released. Nomad only came out in 95 and it wasn't really operationally stable when we released the initial alphas. Right. But now, you know, two years, right? And, and you've got this massive paradigm shift. Now, 
One thing I'm actually pretty certain on is if we, if we kind of look at the patterns in history, that, you know, in the next two years' time, we could be saying exactly the same thing about um, something, something completely different. The, the next generation of scheduler or the, the next generation of storage or, or something um, or yeah. patterns and practices. So it's, it's really difficult to kind of predict the future. Um, and because of this constant change, it's, it kind of, it, you know, you've got to try and play, in some ways you've got to play catch up, but in some ways you've got to try and bet on what's ahead of the market to, to, be, to arrive at the same time. Um, and, and I think Terraform is, is kind of not reacting, but it's, it's, um, it's following this changing market. And I think once we reach stability, in, in actually in the, in the way that we're developing software and that might never happen, then of course Terraform can then start meeting this stability as well. You know, we, it's about like looking at standards. I mean, things like, uh, let's say HTML. HTML has been a, a physical standard for nearly like 20, 20 odd years now. Um, yeah. um, and you SQL go back has to been HTML a if you, if you really, if you want to go crazy, Right. HTML right. is actually a subset of, of SGML. Right. And, and things like SQL, you know, um, SQL has been around for 40 years. C has been around for 40 years. Um, and so I, th I think it takes time for things to kind of evolve and to, to mature. Um, and I don't think you can rush that. I think you've just got to kind of move along and, um, you know, I'm fairly confident, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, well, this, again, it's, this, it's really difficult. This to me is a, is a philosophy issue that, that I like in the way HashiCorp has been building its tools. Because one of the things that makes Terraform powerful here is that it does what it's doing. It works at its layer. It's not trying to be the next layer of abstraction. And that might actually end up being an integrated tool, not expanded into, into Terraform. Um, because, and that's the pattern that we've seen you follow. It's right on, 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 we're not building a big integrated suite that has to absorb more and more stuff. It's, yeah. it's a set of tools and then you can start to replace it. And that allows you to say, oh, wait a second, this wasn't, I mean, I think Vagrant um, has, you know, it was awesome. You know, I, I would say the same thing about Vagrant. It's awesome for what it does. It's horrible when you try and get beyond its, its comfort zone, it, yeah. it falls apart because it was well-designed. That's actually a positive design statement um, yeah. because what you really want to be able to do is say, well, when, I'm, when, when this doesn't fit, I'm not going to keep, um, I'm going to throw OpenStack totally under the bus. I'm not going to take a platform that was designed for running virtual machines and then tell you it's a great container manager or a great hardware right. manager because they're different abstractions. And when I'm going to tell you that, that we can kind of, our tools will solve every problem that you have because they won't, you know, it's, right. it's about trying to help as many people as we can, but, but staying with that limitations. And I think when, when the sort of things that we follow around the, the Unix philosophy about sort of having that singular purpose, I think when a product starts to creep features and, and try to kind of solve too many problems, it, it almost kind of is, um, can, can be a big, a big issue for itself. I mean, you know, the, the, the releases start getting slower because the product is, is bigger and more complicated. Um, you've got many, many different inputs into it. So you've got people from the left saying, hey, I wanted to do this, and people from the right saying, hey, I wanted to do this, and the two may be incompatible. But when you, you kind of concentrate on a product and say, right, these are the distinct boundaries of this product, it's, it's never going to do any more than this. We're not saying we wouldn't create a product to do X, Y, or Z, but you know, it's, it's distinctly not the domain of this particular application to do that. And I think we're pretty stringent on, on that and trying to keep features you know, well-bounded within the particular product definitions. Right. And, and I think that is also, you know, a comfort for somebody adopting a tool. Um, 
right? Because you can, you can stay the path of the tool. You can say what it's going to do. Um, and, and then you can build it into your operational workflow without worrying that it's going to be, you know, some, some weird thing is going to upset the balance. Um, and I think that's, that's generally true, right? You can, I've seen whole tool chains topple when somebody tried to add too big of a feature set and you created this big jump and it left everybody behind. Um, when right. it was really two products. Um, and yeah, a and couple and of examples. A, I, think that's, yeah. I think that's a difficult thing to get right um, of, of when, you know, where should a product be, be different? So, I mean, you look at like Terraform and you look at Packer. Now you could argue that Packer, you're actually terraforming images. So <laughs> like, why doesn't Terraform and Packer just merge? Um, I mean, I think there's probably a number of arguments that that could happen, but you know, it, they, they do have sort of different cadences and different, different sort of purposes. Um, the two work together well. So it's, right. it's not like they're completely um, inoperable uh, together. And, and I think this is the key thing. I think when, when you look at features, you, you really have to have this sort of clear vision of what is the boundary of this product? What really fits into this? And when that starts to creep, when are we gonna just create a whole new product that will sort of satisfy this and ensure that the two things work well, work well together? That's, we're, I, and we're, we're out of time. So I, I'm, I'm resisting, Stephen's giving me the evil eye on the, uh, knowing that I wanna, I wanna jump in on uh, going, going deeper on Packer. Um, for if you if you haven't looked into Packer, Packer is an image builder. Um, we see a lot of people uh, in our customer and community base who are using Packer to build AMIs, um, and then also now starting to use Packer to build disk images for immutable booting and physical. So right, our 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 bent's always on the physical side of it, and so the idea that I could take a system that builds and this is portability. Oh man, I'm just I, I I'm going to resist. You get, you get really interesting portability when you can write a plan that you can use in multiple places, even if it's not abstract, the same tool lets you write plans for both. And then you could use the same tool like Packer to build images that even though they're different images could actually be deployed in multiple infrastructures. So, um, which keeps your workflow exactly the same, right? You're, you're just kind of saying I might be using apples and sometimes I'm going to be using oranges, but, but ultimately I have a, a consistent, a consistent workflow. And, and I like that too. I mean, that, I'm a, a big fan of that approach. And that's, that's what we hear when we talk to people. It's like, even if I can't, even if my, the code library, my plan or my image is not the same, my process for building it or my tools that I'm using are the same and that's enough. Uh, for right. you know, for the way people need to operate today. Um, I think any any. I, I want to wrap it up uh, from a time perspective. Any I'll any closing comments in. or thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> Nick, what's what 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 did what what did we miss? Um, I I had a great time. I think I'm uh, I'm always happy to talk about this stuff because um, I'm just trying to think. You know, I think. I think there's a whole kind of area. I mean, we, we briefly chatted about this um, the, the other day. Like, you know, I think automation is, is just incredibly important. And I think we've barely scratched the surface on, on what we can automate and, and how we can automate. Um, and, and I think sort of machinery, you know, images, um, physical machines, they, they are super, super uh, relevant, super important. Being able to have that process and that flow. I've, I've been working in the industry when the, the, the flow was a, a scrap of paper and a bunch of floppy disks or CDs. And literally, I could almost guarantee you it would go wrong every time, right? It was, it was impossible to reproduce it. But when you can follow that workflow of being able to create your machine images with uh, in a rep reproducible format, when you can push those to your bare metal, where you can test that the result is correct, 
And once you have that process, knowing that the next time you run it, it's going to be exactly the same. Um, I think that's a wonderful thing. And um, I think we shouldn't take that for granted. I think it's a, uh, a very beneficial thing. But like, can we go further? Yeah, for sure. I mean, like seriously, terraform all the things. I, um, I, I wish I could terraform a blog post or, or something like that. We, maybe we need some like high level thing where we can mix machine learning and some, some terraform. Well, uh, well, Nick, it sounds like you have a, a new startup in mind. And, uh, you know, after, after all our companies get sold and Rob makes his millions, we can, uh, we can start that one. But unfortunately, Nick, I, I am the one who comes in and has to stop Rob because otherwise he should be three, four hour podcast no, hours and hours. And uh, clearly, um, thank you so much for coming. If uh, listeners want to uh, follow you catch up, uh, where should they look for you? Oh, generally Twitter, I think, um, is a good place to go. I'm, I'm Sheriff Jackson on, on Twitter. Um, but if you, if you do have a question about anything and like, it doesn't just have to be about HashiCorp, then Nick at HashiCorp.com as well. It's NIC. Um, I'm always happy to, to help anybody with who's got a problem. And I think Greg, um, you know, listening to this podcast, uh, oh, sorry, Nick, I think we're going to bring Greg on and bring you back sooner rather than later for a follow-up podcast to do the tech stuff. Cause I know Rob was itching to do it and when we get Greg in, we'll go about 80 levels deep and uh, that'll be where I get lost. But, but I think there's a lot of goodness there and uh, certainly we'll bring you soon. Well, we appreciate you joining us today. Uh, thanks again for our listeners. As I always say, if you, if you're interested in a topic or have a guest you'd like us to uh, reach out to, uh, let us know. And Nick, thanks again uh, for joining us today. Amazing. It's my absolute pleasure. Thank you both.